Welcome to the Cosmic Savannah with Dr. Daniel Kahneman and Dr. Jacinta Del Hayes. Each episode, we'll be giving you a behind the scenes look at world class astronomy and astrophysics happening under African skies. Let us introduce you to the people involved, the technology we use, the exciting work we do, and the fascinating discoveries we make. Sit back and relax as we take you on a safari through the skies. Welcome to episode 38. Yeah, hi everyone, welcome back, and welcome to our new listeners. Yeah, today we will be speaking to Dr. Michelle Lochner, who will be talking to us about machine learning. And artificial intelligence, and how that can be used in astronomy. But before we get into that, you've been doing some podcasting outside of the Cosmic Savannah. Yeah, I have, but as a guest, (laughs) several listeners here may have already heard it. I was a guest expert on the Jim Jeffries podcast. I don't know about that. Jim Jeffries is a comedian and every week he kind of has another expert guest about some different topic. And I did the latest episode on uh, galaxies and it was a lot of fun and very different. (laughs) Yeah, his style's a little different to ours. He's a stand-up comedian, so I think he takes a completely different approach to podcasting. Did you did you hear it, Dan? I, I did. I gave it a listen. I thought, I thought it was great, and you did really well. <laughs> Thanks. His questions were very different. The conversation <laughs> went in all different directions, but I loved it. It was great. Yeah, if, if any of our listeners want to go check it out, excuse the hardy dars over here, you can find it on any podcasting platforms, also on YouTube where they have a video. And it's called I Don't Know About That with Jim Jeffries. And we should probably warn you that there is some strong language. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's a bit irreverent. It's not the the same as our <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but actually talking about the Jim Jeffries podcast, I wanted to fact check myself a little bit. So maybe some of our listeners picked up a small mistake that I made, or maybe not. I don't know. I said that most of the gold and silver on Earth were formed in supernova explosions. But actually, that's not true. Most of it was formed in the collisions of two neutron stars. And I don't think we've actually done an episode on that specifically, but we do have one coming up. Some of the gold and silver on Earth was formed in supernova, but most was in the collisions of pulsars. And I also said that it could also have been the collision of black holes. But thinking about that, that's probably not true, is it, Dan? No, that's definitely not true. (laughs) (laughs) And the reason for that, of course, is that nothing escapes from a black hole, not even light. Exactly. So, yeah, in 2017, there was the first observed neutron star merger. And there we observed the remnants of that neutron star merger and managed to work out that that's where most of the gold and silver, along with many other elements, actually, is formed. Yeah, and I've actually done a long blog post about that, so I really should have known this. <laughs> you can go to my website, jacintadelhays.com, and it's on my blog, and it's the first blog post that I did, and you can read all about that if you're interested. <laughs> so there we go. It's important to fact check even ourselves. And you have also been doing something quite exciting recently, Dan. Yeah, I've been engaging in some construction myself. I've probably mentioned it before. We're building a new visitor center here in Cape Town which will hopefully open later this year. And yeah, so this morning I was Bob the Builder, had my hard hat on and my safety boots, and we lifted a new telescope, a solar telescope, onto the visitor center roof, which was super exciting. Got to play with the crane, although I didn't drive it. And yeah, super fun. Great. And what are you installing? So it's called a heliostat, and it is a telescope which will observe the sun through the day and project an image of the sun into the room below so we'll be able to see a live view of the sun and if there's sunspots or or any interesting things on the sun to see then we'll be able to see those but it'll also have a spectrograph on it and a spectrograph essentially splits up the sun's light into all of its constituent wavelengths so we'll be able to have a, a spectrum of the sun a live spectrum of the sun which we'll also be able to observe awesome did you just say that you got to drive it yourself No, I didn't get to drive it myself. Oh, (laughs) because that would be fun. (laughs) No, that would have been a boyhood dream. (laughs) Yeah, but maybe not breaking the telescope. That may not have been so good. (laughs) Cool. All right. Well, shall we talk about today's episode? 
now that we are how many minutes in? I think we should. <laughs> okay, great. Yes, as you said, today we are talking to senior lecturer from the University of the Western Cape, Dr. Michelle Lochner, and she's going to be telling us all about machine learning and AI and neural networks and all of these really amazing things, which I've heard very little about. I didn't know much of this at all. And so it was very interesting to talk to Michelle. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, not a lot of people know about this and it's a very new field in astronomy and very exciting because it's opening up a whole new avenue of astronomy in terms of the dealing with the big data that we have and trying to work through that at a level that humans can't actually keep up with. So Michelle explains all about that and her work on the Meerkat telescope and also the Vera C. Rubin telescope, which is performing the LSST, the, help me out here, Dan, Large Synoptic Survey Telescope? Legacy. Le Legacy, okay. What, what is it? Ooh. Legacy Survey Telescope, maybe Synoptic. <laughs> I think we... Mm. Okay, we'll Google that in the meantime. No, Michelle will tell us. Michelle will tell us. Without further ado, let's uh, let's hear from Michelle. With us today, we have Dr. Michelle Lochner, who is a senior lecturer at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, Jacinta. How are you doing? Good, thanks. We've got Dan here as well. Welcome to the Cosmic Savannah. Hey, Dan. Thanks for joining us today, Michelle. Just to start off, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, who you are, and et cetera? Sure. So I'm Michelle Lochner. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of the Western Cape, but I also have a staff scientist position at the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, which I'm sure by now everybody knows about because of the exciting Meerkat and SKA telescopes. And I'm interested in a lot of different things in astronomy and cosmology, but in particular applying machine learning and other cool data science techniques uh, to try and handle the massive amounts of data coming from our amazing modern telescopes. All right. So first of all, what is machine learning? Yeah, so maybe not everybody's heard of machine learning, but I'm sure everybody has heard of artificial intelligence or AI. That's definitely been part of our sci-fi viewing for many years. Uh, so artificial intelligence is really any computer program that is making decisions. So you find it on your phones, on airplanes, even in your washing machine. But machine learning is a particular type of artificial intelligence that's uh, become really, really important in recent years. And the idea behind machine learning is that it can learn to do things without being explicitly programmed. So it's an algorithm that can teach itself by looking at data. And this has become really important for everything. There are many machine learning algorithms running on your phone, running in your email, maybe recommending good music to you. But it's becoming more and more important in astronomy as well to try and handle in automated ways the, the huge volume of data that we've got coming in up until now, it's been small enough for humans to be able to do everything. We're now starting to have to rely on the machines a lot more. How do you set up a machine to learn about astronomy, though? <laughs> That's a great question. So you always have to start with data, right? You've got to start with your data and you've got to start with a question. So a great example in the ordinary world is, say you want to be able to tell the difference between cats and dogs. And this is a very important question that needs to be solved. So you would have to run a machine learning algorithm, which uh, is designed to figure out the difference between cats and dogs in an automated way. And you've got to start with a data set, a training set of known examples of cats and dogs. There are many different algorithms that you can choose. For instance, one called neural networks, which are very popular, which is based on how we think the human brain works and is made up of these connected neurons that you can then train with your training set of known examples of cats and dogs. And once you have a trained neural network, you can apply it to new data to say, hey, is that a cat or is that a dog? And these are the algorithms that Google, for instance, is running all the time. If you've ever done a, a Google image search, it's running a neural network in the background. We do this pretty similarly in astronomy. We may, for example, have a sample of spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies. And 
years ago, people would do this manually, look through the data and say, yes, that looks like a spiral or yes, it looks like an elliptical. But we now regularly have data sets with millions of objects. You know, there's, just, there's just no way a human can go through all of them. So we would create a training set of known spirals and ellipticals, train, for instance, a neural network algorithm to be able to tell the difference and then apply it to larger data sets that we can then do some science with. That's a type of machine learning called supervised machine learning that's very popular, but I actually work in a different branch of machine learning mostly called unsupervised learning. Okay, I have so many questions. Um, I don't know where to start. Okay, so we're going to find out about unsupervised learning in a second. But first of all, you said that we start with huge amounts of data, that we've got huge amounts of data at the moment, so we can't look through all of it by eye. How much data do we have? Ah, it depends on the data set. But already the Meerkat telescope, which is the precursor to the SKA telescope, which will be sort of the, the, the biggest telescope on Earth, Meerkat's already producing terabytes of processed data. So the unprocessed data is, is much larger, but these are even final images, radio images, and they're in the terabytes. It's already too big to download onto your laptop. And each image might contain thousands of radio galaxies. Then you've also got huge optical surveys being done with a variety of telescopes around the world that's easily producing a catalog of a billion galaxies. And you know now you have to try to search through all of these. Here's another number to overwhelm you. The Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later. It's a telescope being built in Chile. Here's a cool number. It's such a powerful and sensitive telescope that it will detect 10 million transients every night. So 10 million times a night, something on the sky will change and this telescope will detect it. And some fraction of those will be interesting, cool objects that we've never seen before that we want to follow up. But that's 10 million every single night that we somehow have to process and do some science with. So the numbers are getting just more and more ridiculous the more telescopes we build. That's staggering. <laughs> 10 million per night. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> we, we should probably just clarify what a transient is too. I mean, so we've talked about transients once before. So these are things that essentially go bump in the night. And now we hear that there's 10 million of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of bumps. So they, they could be things like supernova, right? Exploding stars or, or those sorts of things. But what else are you detecting when you're detecting transients? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, about half of those 10 million things are not going to be astrophysical at all. There will be cosmic rays or airplanes or, of course, satellites. Lots of them will be satellites. Ah, the satellite constellation, <laughs> mm -hmm, unfortunately. <laughs> Starlink. <laughs> yeah, Starlink is a real problem for, for optical telescopes. Mm. But, you know, still about half of those are going to be actually interesting things. Uh, so supernovae is one that you mentioned, which are massive explosions of stars. Within our galaxy, there'll be things like variable stars. So these are, are ordinary stars that pulsate and, and change. There will be active galactic nuclei. So these are, I've heard them called galaxies behaving badly. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you hear that? <laughs> I think I'm pretty sure it was Prof Wilcott who said that. <laughs> it's just stuck in my mind. Galaxies behaving badly. So supermassive black holes in, inside galaxies devouring things and spitting out lots of radiation. Of course, there's the rare kilonova that we're, we're hoping to find a few more of that we've only ever detected one of. These are the most powerful of the supernova, right? Well, these are the results of a binary neutron star merger. And if you remember the, the gravitational wave event of a few years ago that made such a stir in astronomy, that's the one and only kilonova we've detected. So there, a gravitational wave was detected and then telescopes followed up and then found the kilonova, right? But it's possible that in amongst these 10 million transients every night, one couple of them could be kilonova. So that's a real needle in a haystack problem. And of course, there's all kinds of things that we, we can't even predict now. I mean, maybe there will be new types of transients that we haven't discovered up until now. These are the things that I'm really excited about. Okay. Okay, so now we're talking about transients, but let's get back to the machine learning. Okay, so there's going to be all of these things 
that this telescope, the Vera C. Rubin telescope and, you know, Meerkat and the SKA, they're all going to be detecting these strange things. And so it's just impossible for humans to go through this and find them all themselves by eye. So we need computers to do this. Now, so you're talking about machine learning, like artificial intelligence, and one type of that you said is called neural network. So can we just go back to that? I didn't quite understand. So you said it's kind of like the human brain. Now, is I don't know anything about this. So are you able to describe that in a way that I might be able to understand what a neural network is? Sure. Okay, let me try. So what does a machine learning algorithm do? It's often referred to as a black box. It's a thing that takes inputs, does some stuff, and produces outputs. Okay, that's, that's one way of thinking of a machine learning algorithm. Okay, I'm still with you now. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so in the example of telling the difference between cats and dogs, the input would be an image, so some kind of picture, and the output would be cat or dog right? So it's the prediction of what should this label be for this image. Okay. So the question is, what's all the bits in the middle? What's, what's the stuff doing that goes from an image to cat or dog? The bit in the middle is the algorithm itself. And there are many different ones. You can think of it as this complicated mathematical model, and there's many different ways of building them. So a neural network will take an image and pass it through what's called a layer of neurons. So these are like neurons in the brain. And there can be many layers of neurons that are connected in some particular way. Okay, but when we say neuron, sorry for interrupting you there, but it's not like an actual neuron in our brain. It's some piece of code, right? It's a piece of code, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a piece of code. There's like little chunks of pieces of code right. that it's passing yeah, through. Yeah, that's right, that's okay. right. So you can think of it as these pieces of code that we use mathematics to connect to each other. The actual training part learns how important each bit of code is in being able to transform from the image to the label. Okay, so it's deciding the importance. Yeah, exactly. Of each of these bits of information. Yeah. So basically, for the cat and dog example, right, the neural network is going to learn cats have pointy ears, dogs have sort of soft or fluffy ears, and therefore the ear neuron is an important one. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can think of it that way, yeah. It ends up... Uh, um, <laughs> it's, it's hashtag complicated. It's, it is complicated. It ends up being along those lines. Yeah, you could say that some parts of the neural network will be sensitive to the, you know, the color or the overall shape of the animal. Some parts will be sensitive to the length of the tail and the, the, the size of the ears. So it does end up working out kind of like that, yes. Okay, but we're not actually looking at pictures of cats and dogs. We're looking at pictures of galaxies, right? Well, that's what your work does. Maybe can you tell us more about that? What I'm interested in is a different branch of machine learning where we don't know what we're looking for. The most common types of machine learning that people work on is like the cats and dogs example, where we have some training set, we have some known thing that we're looking for, and we can train a neural network, for example, to look for that thing. I am more interested in finding the unknown unknowns. So the things that we didn't know we should have been looking for. And that's quite a bit harder because of course you don't have your training data. Uh, you don't have any known examples by definition. And so what I do is I might take a data set of galaxies such as from the Meerkat telescope. So I have all these beautiful radio galaxies. And I want to run a, a version of machine learning called anomaly detection. So looking for all the rare galaxies in this data set. So what I have to do is find, this, this actually gets even more complicated than neural networks. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what are we going into now? <laughs> I can imagine. Who'd have thought? All right. So let, let let me let me see if I can if I can if I can describe this. So this actually works quite differently to the neural networks. What I do is I find a way to describe the shapes of galaxies, a kind of mathematical way, and I do this by asking the question. How similar is this galaxy to an ellipse? 
because a lot of the time, ordinary, boring galaxies that aren't doing anything interesting just look like ellipses. Whereas things like merging galaxies, for instance, or just weirdly shaped galaxies, interacting galaxies, don't look like ellipses. They look like they have strange shapes. So I do something called feature extraction, which is a way of simplifying your data down to a simple set of numbers. And in this case, my numbers describe the shapes of the galaxies using these ellipses. Okay, are you with me? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Dan, maybe you can describe what Michelle just said. <laughs> <laughs> so so I think I mean I think the thing is right. So you're looking at something like a galaxy and you don't really know how you want to classify it and you don't know that they come in spirals or ellipses or whatever. So you compare it to a square. Hmm, nothing really looks like a square. You compare it to a circle. Some of them look a bit circle. You compare it to a few other things. The computer builds up an understanding of how these things look on its own. And then it looks deeper at the various galaxies and sorts them into what it thinks are a good classification system. So maybe the computer won't come up with the same classification system as we would in terms of spirals and ellipses. And maybe it'll have some new idea. And I think that's where it gets really interesting because you start to see patterns and information which the, the human eye or human brain maybe wouldn't have seen. Yeah, that's that's a that's a great summary. Yeah. So, oh, well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, but then yeah. now I want to take it to the next step. So these transients, right? We're getting 10 million transients a night. Now, you know what a Starlink satellite looks like when it goes over. Presumably, you know what an aeroplane looks like, although depending on its path, it might be a bit different. And you know what a supernova, so, so you've, you've got a trained data set already for these. But then do you run a concurrent unsupervised algorithm on that to try and find things which we didn't know existed? Yeah, that's good. So the, the supervised algorithms will always try and give you an answer. They'll always tell you the closest thing that this thing looks like from its training set, even if it's completely wrong. So supervised algorithms are really designed to, to classify no matter what, even if it does quite badly. So you do have to run a separate anomaly detection to try to find things that it's never seen before. The, the classifiers just aren't designed that way. It's a completely different type of algorithm you have to run. So then what's unsupervised learning? It's not even a great name, really. Supervised learning simply means you have a training set, so you know exactly what you're looking for. So you can use that training set to train an algorithm to, for instance, classify different types of galaxies. Unsupervised learning means you don't have a training set. You don't know what you're looking for. And so the, 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 the two kind of branches of unsupervised learning are Basically, exactly what, what Dan hit on is something called clustering, looking for things that even though the, the algorithm doesn't know what they are, it knows they look similar. And indeed, sometimes they come up with different groupings to what we would normally do. And then the other thing you can do is, is what I've been working on, which is anomaly detection. So in the example where we are fitting shapes to the galaxies, I'm looking for ones that are a bad fit, right? They don't look much like the shapes of most of the galaxies in the data set. So really looking for any kind of outliers or abnormal galaxies. Okay, so that makes sense. Now, can you give us some examples of what kind of anomalies you're finding or you know, what kind of clusters you're finding? Yeah, so probably the, the type of anomaly my algorithm has so far been most sensitive to is in the optical anyway, merging galaxies. So these are two galaxies that are literally merging, joining to become one, or just galaxies that are interacting. So sometimes, you know, you see these, these big streams of stars and gas being um, stripped from one galaxy to another. Tidal streams. So, so it really anything that's got an unusual shape. I've picked up a couple of strong lenses, for instance, yeah, so basically anything with unusual shapes. In the radio, so radio galaxies are really fun, <laughs> They're the, especially the anomalous ones. I agree. 
<laughs> I've been mostly picking up any kind of radio galaxy that's interacting. So usually interacting with the intergalactic medium. So, you you know, like the, the kind of standard radio galaxy has these big jets that come out of the supermassive black hole. And if these jets are interacting in some way with the intergalactic medium, it gives them interesting shapes. So you see these bent tail galaxies and, and just things that have strange morphologies. Those are the types of things that have been mostly sensitive to. So you're working on Meerkat, right? And you are detecting these anomalies in, in galaxies. Now, I don't want to keep going back to the, the Vera Rubin Observatory, although I do love a good transient. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite obvious why we want to identify anomalies because you want to find something that went bump in the night that you don't know what it is because that's something potentially interesting. Mm -hmm. What do you learn from detecting an anomalous galaxy so, or some sort of galaxy which doesn't fit the standard? Ah, that's a, that's a great question. So I was going to ask the same one, Dan, by the way. <laughs> yeah, of course you were. <laughs> No, actually, wait, I was, and I wanted to say, like, Michelle, what what do you think the scientific benefit of this is? So all, all of that in one question. <laughs> right. So, that, I mean, that's a great question. So I, I, in science, we always try to break whatever is the status quo, right? So whatever is the, the current model of the universe, we're looking for things that break it, right? So the, the idea of finding unusual galaxies is that it can help improve our understanding of all types of things, but basically how these galaxies evolve and how they work. So I'll give you an example. Meerkat's a great example because Meerkat is really more sensitive than any telescope that's come before it. So it is starting to find radio galaxies that really don't quite look like anything we've seen before. We're starting to see much finer detail than we've ever seen before. And so it's been able to answer some questions of how these galaxies actually form, you know, how they're interacting with each other, just understanding more about galaxy evolution. And my, you know, my thinking is that when we have billions of galaxies in a data set, it's very likely that some of these interesting things will be missed. And we really are looking for things that either challenge our current models of how we understand galaxy evolution or help answer questions that we haven't been able to answer until now because we just didn't have sensitive enough data. I'm never looking to answer any particular science question because that would mean I know what I'm looking for, right? But once we find something weird, the next step is to go, okay, well, what is this? And what does it mean? What do we learn about the universe from this weird and unusual object? So the question which I guess a lot of people would ask is, are you not putting astronomers out of a job? <laughs> that's, that is, that's a great question. Okay. So my work is all about when we have these data sets of billions of objects and we know it's not possible for a human to search through all of these data sets to find interesting objects. What do we do? How can we automate scientific discovery? If we can automate scientific discovery, yeah, it's true. Surely we're putting all astronomers out of a job. What are PhD students going to do with their, with their degrees? <laughs> well, actually, conversely, I think these algorithms are really important to enable scientists to do their jobs. And in fact, I the more I work in machine learning, the more I realize how important it is to have a human involved in making the final decisions. No machine learning algorithm is 100% perfect. And every machine learning algorithm really actually needs improvement. So a lot of the time when people apply machine learning, they apply it to some known data set and they say, oh, look, I got an accuracy of 97% and then that's done. But how do you use them in the real world? How do you use them on real scientific data sets? And I think that having the, it's called human in the loop learning. So having the human involved to improve the machine learning algorithm is really critical. So what I've been working on is a publicly available software called Astronomaly. 
I'm very proud of the name. And I love the name. <laughs> I love the name because it's astronomy anomaly. Exactly. Astronomy. It turns out to it turns out to be really hard to say, but anyway. Thanks for explaining it, Jacinta. <laughs> so the idea behind astronomy is that if you've ever watched Netflix or whatever streaming service and it says, Oh, we think you'd like to watch this thing next. It's usually completely wrong, but you know there, there are these things called recommendation engines, which are being used more and more, like for online shopping or for music streaming, etc. And so the idea behind Astronomaly is building a recommendation engine for scientific discovery, specifically in astronomical data sets. Now the important question. If these networks, these learning algorithms are unsupervised and while we're busy not micromanaging them, are they going to rise up and are the robots going to come and kill us? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it's I think that's the inevitable end of the human race. <laughs> you know, you know to be, to be honest, for all the incredible things that machine learning can do, it really can do some amazing things. These algorithms are quite specific and quite specialized and they are just not that smart, at least not yet. So I'm, I'm personally right now not very worried <laughs> about the robots, uh, you know, have, about my toaster rising up against me. It will come eventually. I mean, it's, it's inevitable if you, can, if you can build general artificial intelligence. But I really don't think we're, I personally don't think we're very close to that. Okay, so no Terminator just yet. So... We talked a little bit about the transients already, and this is part of the VRC Rubin Observatory, which is coming soon. You're involved in that quite heavily, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. The VRC Rubin Observatory is a really exciting project. It's a telescope being built in Chile. It's mostly a US-led project, but there's a lot of international involvement as well. And South Africa got involved a few years ago, and now it's getting even more involved, which is really exciting. So this telescope will be just, it's almost like, the SKA, but for optical, so it's going to do this incredible survey of the entire southern sky. And South Africa bought in or got involved a few years ago, and I was announced as one of the three South African principal investigators. Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Which means that I get access to the data immediately as soon as it comes off the telescope and, you know, get to work on it and get to be involved, basically. And uh, it's, what's really exciting is that we're increasing the number of PIs uh, available. So more South African scientists are going to get involved. And the cool thing about the Rubin Observatory is that although the data is not available immediately, it is made public after some time. And there's a lot of work being done in preparing these incredible platforms for the general public to actually have access to the data and work with it. So I'm working on setting up anomaly detection on Rubin data. And my hope is that citizens all over the world can get involved in the citizen science project and maybe even make amazing scientific discoveries in this public data set. So that's, that's what I'm really excited about for this project. Oh, that's so awesome. And when you say you're the PI, are you the PI of a particular project or is this a general thing? Obviously, I wrote a proposal for the type of work that I wanted to do, which was all around machine learning, specifically working on both Meerkat and Rubin data together, so multi-wavelength stuff. But yeah, so even though it's, it's a general proposal around a particular area, it's, it's not the same as a PI of a specific project. So I, I lead a team, I have students and postdocs on my team working in this area. Oh, okay. So like the telescope just takes the data of the whole sky every night and then you're the PI of a particular research project. Is that right? That's right. It's quite different from how, so for instance, with Meerkat, you would write a research proposal and, and then you get your data to work on your project for whatever. Yeah, you kind of request time to look at a particular part of the sky. Yeah, exactly. Whereas the, the Rubin Observatory is undertaking this thing called the LSST, so the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And it's a 10 year survey. So basically they're just doing this massive single survey 
and then everybody gets access to the data to do whatever science they want. So I'm very involved in the cosmology side, for instance, but people are doing transients, people are doing solar system studies, galactic studies. It's, it's quite ambitious that you have this single massive survey out of which tons of science should come. And the telescope is enormous as well, right? Yeah, so it's a it's a 10 meter class telescope. But what's what's incredible about it really, it's got very clever optics and it's also got the biggest camera in the world on this <laughs> telescope. It's a, yes. it's, wow. it's a it's like a 4 gigapixel camera. It's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but the physical camera, I think it's it's like a 2 meter diameter camera. I, I can't remember the exact number, but it's something like that. Awesome. It's really massive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. And just before we go, I wanted to ask you about one more thing. Not only are you an amazing scientist and a, and a wonderful role model, you also take a lot of care for the, the well-being of the community and you run something called the Supernova Foundation. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the Supernova Foundation is a mentoring and network program for women and gender minorities in physics. So it's a, it's a program I set up a few years ago and it's grown. We have about 400 members now from all over the world. Over 50 countries, I think, are represented. So the idea is that we try to connect senior women physicists, women and gender minorities, with students from all over the world who are likely to be in environments which are male dominated. So they don't necessarily have role models in their immediate environment. So virtual platform, which has been great for during the pandemic, especially. Yeah, basically mentors and mentees meet up usually around once a month for mentoring and we have webinars and we basically have just, just tried to kind of build a community and it's been a, it's been a really amazing, really positive experience. I think we've We've had some some great impact on on quite a few people around the world. That's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> so, if there are some women or people of gender minorities uh, listening to this who would like to get involved, participate in this, either as a mentor or a mentee, how can they do that? Sure, uh, you can just go ahead on the website supernovafoundation.org, and yeah, there's a sign up page. So, if you are interested, we would very much welcome you. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks. I mean, it's excellent work and we'll definitely post those links on our website too. Before we go, is there any final message you'd like to send to our listeners? <laughs> what can I say? Well, machine learning is something that's in everybody's lives, in your phone, in your computer, in, in everything you do. Like many things, it can be used for great things and it can be used for some not so nice things. But uh, I hope after listening to this, uh, you've seen how excited I am about using machine learning in astronomy, where I think it's, it's being put to great use, getting the best science out of amazing telescopes like Meerkat. So I hope your listeners are as excited as I am about it. Certainly after this. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for your passion and thank you for your work. Great. Thanks so much, Jacinta. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Michelle. So the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, LSST. We weren't even close, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> well, we learned something today. I think I learned a few things today, actually. Yeah, very interesting conversation with Michelle. Yeah, it's um, this machine learning thing is is really cool, and I'm really excited about it. So if I can talk about radio galaxies for a second now, Dan, is that okay? Sure. <laughs> So our regular listeners will know that I work a lot on radio galaxies and radio surveys, and these are um, galaxies that have supermassive black holes in the centre, releasing huge amounts of radio light. And when we look through our data, we find we can just see lots of them, but they have quite complicated shapes. And one blob over here may be associated with another blob over here in the same system, but they, they kind of look separated on the sky. And what Michelle's algorithm does partly, or other algorithms like that, is actually find those blobs and associate it with the same thing. And this takes hours and hours and hours and hours of our time. Certainly I've spent a lot of time myself trying to figure these things out. And to have a computer program that will do it for you is going to be really kind of 
game changing is the word I'm <laughs> yeah yeah exactly is the word I'm looking for and I love that Michelle was saying was kind of calling this automated scientific discoveries and she said you know it's not the computers that are making the discoveries and writing the papers it's freeing up our time to actually do the science you know we don't need to go and identify these objects the, the computer identifies them for us and then we can follow up and do the science and understand what they are and write the papers so this is really exciting for me I think yeah, it's super exciting. I think one of the other things that's worth noting is that when you're doing this sort of work, like you're trying to identify radio galaxies or transients or whatever, uh, we don't always have perfect data. So, you know, we don't we don't get a perfect light curve or a perfect observation every single time or a perfect map of a galaxy. We always get like parts of it and sometimes different parts of it. So these machine learning algorithms will be better at sort of piecing together the full picture based on an incomplete puzzle, which I think is is very cool. And I think that, you know, that's, like you said, something which is very difficult at the moment to try and piece together these these observations yourself. So having some sort of algorithm which can do this efficiently and, and accurately or more accurately really is, as you say, going to be a game changer. Yeah, and the fact that Michelle is actually applying it mostly to the unknown unknowns, that is so cool. Like whenever you build a, a new big telescope like Meerkat or the SKA or the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, you have to design it with the science science goals in mind because you have to make sure that it is going to discover the things that you are hoping that it will discover will be good enough to do the science that you want it to do. But it's really hard to design a telescope that is good for discovering something that you don't know exists. These are the unknown unknowns. And so I love that Michelle is taking the, the data that we already have and finding, looking for unknown unknowns. And this is where, you know, this is where the really groundbreaking stuff is in like finding things that, you know, our current algorithms or our current, even our own brains may miss because we aren't looking for it. Michelle's going to find those things. So maybe some really exciting things could come out of that. Yeah, for sure. We we spoken a lot about SKA and how it's going to be identifying things we hadn't thought existed or, you know, hadn't thought to look for. But it's not the only big telescope coming up, right? The Vera C. Rubin telescope and the LSST survey. These are also working on it and there's going to be some amazing stuff coming from that. So, yeah, it's, it's exciting times as always in astronomy and great that South Africa is involved in the LSST and getting more involved, it sounds like. Yeah, for sure. As we always say, exciting things are coming up and tune in here to hear, more, to hear all about it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I think that's it for today. Yeah, I think that about covers it. As always, thanks very much for listening and we hope you'll join us next time on The Cosmic Savannah. You can visit our website, thecosmicsavannah.com, where we'll have the transcript, links and other stuff related to today's episode. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at Cosmic Savannah. That's Savannah spelled S-A-V-A-N-N-A-H. Special thanks today to Dr. Michelle Lochner for speaking with us. Thanks to our social media manager, Sumari Hatting. Also to Mark Allnut for music production, Jacob Fine for sound editing, Michal Wercek for photography, Carl Jones for astrophotography and Susie Karras for graphic design. We gratefully acknowledge support from the South African National Research Foundation and the South African Astronomical Observatory, as well as the University of Cape Town Astronomy Department. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd really appreciate it if you could rate and review us or recommend us to a friend. And we'll speak to you next time on the Cosmic Savannah. I must say my... My Netflix algorithm is shocking. Yeah, it's really bad. Truly it's, shocking. It really is bad. <laughs> I, I'm trying to build a better one. <laughs> Mine. Apparently, TikTok is incredible. I wouldn't know. I'm not on TikTok, but apparently its algorithm is amazing. <laughs> That's a story for another day, though. I, <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm just very predictable. Netflix gets me pretty much every time. <laughs>